Documentaries are about the people that you meet and the stories you can tell. Stories of tragedy, laughter, hope and desperation across faraway lands or right here in your own backyard. This podcast brings these stories to you, the listener, so that you can experience the adventures of documentary filmmaking in audio form while embarking on daily adventures of your own. Welcome to Barefoot Media's Stories Within Stories podcast with your host, Simon Holland. At the age of 18, Carla Van Ray entered a convent to devote her life to God. By 35, she was earning her living as a prostitute. As a child, Carla experienced a trauma that changed her life forever. Burdened by the weight of this terrible secret, all she wanted to do was survive. Life as a nun promised refuge from the outside world. Carla hoped to find love and understanding within the convent walls. Instead, she became enmeshed in a complex system of regulations that drove her to the brink of madness. Finally released from her vows, she escaped back into the real world. A hasty marriage and separation left Carla with a daughter to support. She turned to another age-old profession, prostitution. She worked as an escort to learn the ropes and then struck out on her own, setting up a massage service. God's call girl was born. When the sex worker business began to unravel, Carla embarked on a journey of healing and self-discovery to uncover and understand the imprint the dark secrets of her past had left on her. Welcome to the show, Carla. I'm happy to be here, Simon. Thank you very much for meeting with us. Sure. It's quite an incredible, like it's actually astonishing that, that you're here in Perth and available to talk particularly that I just read your book and finished the last chapter sitting in your chair <laughs> with you watching me. Yeah, I think I'm the most up-to-date person there is. And I mean, the takeaway from the book was like, bloody hell, you gave life a crack, didn't you? Mm. That's right. Or, or, yeah, life gave me a crack. <laughs> <laughs> that book came out in 2004. If you were to write the postscript chapter now, mm. well, what does that look like? Oh, well, that's a big question, Simon. All right, let's see. Well, the healing journey that I describe at the end of the book, that has continued. So because then I've realised that forgiveness of whatever happens in your life is actually the most important thing, the ability to do that. But how do you do that, you see? I found it's not easy, uh, especially if something has recently happened. I've learned to, to, to not react even though I want to very strongly in the in the moment but just to say just give myself space to bring in some bit of wisdom before I make a decision about it or before I open up my mouth about it so but learning to forgive and I learned that through studying A Course in Miracles I've studied it for three years now and I've begun the fourth year every time it goes deeper or I, I see more of it but it is it's a, the the most transformative um, study of of the mind that I've ever come across, and I think that's that's what's influenced me most in the last three years. I've, I've been looking for that kind of thing. I think for the last since since I left, you know, since since the book was published, that's what I've been looking for. Yeah. Mm. And so all those things that happened to you in the book. So you were you grew up in the Nether- in the Netherlands or Holland, kind of wartime era actually. Just before the war. Just yeah. before, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then all of that happened and then you became a Catholic nun. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then you went and became a call girl. Yeah. Yeah, so God's call girl. Yeah. And so it's interesting that you say that all that like living, that, that the most of the learning happened after that book's finished. Yeah, you're quite right. But, you know, writing the book was a learning experience in itself. Because it's based on journals. A lot of it's based on journals. I, I wrote journals since uh, I was 12, from the age of 12, and gave them to my mother. When I entered the convent at the age of 18, I said to my mother, I'm never going, you know, I'm dedicating my life to God now, so just burn all these journals. Yeah. And she, she did. She burnt one, and she kept all the rest. Oh, really? <laughs> and they all came back to me after she died. They all came back to me. So I had those journals to refer to, you know, later on, uh, which helped my book, which helped me in the writing of the book. Yeah. 
I was wondering how you did that, actually, because it's so detailed and so richly written. And I try to think, you know, do I remember things in that level of detail? So that explains a lot, actually, the journals. Yeah. Uh, I do have a, quite a sharp memory, unusually, I think, of a, a very young childhood. Mm. You know, that I can, I can remember what happened to me, what happened when I was just a two-year-old, one-year-old. Yeah. Yeah. And very clear memories. So not, not, not many of them, but... That must have been quite impressive, the things that did happen. Yeah. I felt like when you were writing, it wasn't really, there was a saying somewhere in the book to Shakespeare, I think it said, there's neither good nor bad, just thinking that makes it so, yep. or, some, or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I felt the whole time I couldn't really tell whether you, you were referring to it as a bad experience or a positive experience. So it kind of like, it's a little bit of an interesting perspective that you, where you were coming from with some things. What, what did you, what do you feel about it? Mm-hmm. Well, you see it. Being, a, being born a Catholic girl child was a difficult thing. And I think I did bring that across. You know, it wasn't easy considering what happened, but what my, what my, my mother didn't kiss me until after the baptism, for instance, because I was a child of the devil until I was baptized. See, this was the south of Holland, which was more superstitious than Ireland, I think, at that time. And so when I tried to make light of that, I tried to bring in the humor of the stupidity of, of religion, really, um, because I'm, because it means nothing to me now. It means the hardship of that religion. I can now, I can now look at it and smile, you know. But I also want to make light of it, and that's the idea. I think that the humour comes through not not as a in a Dutch Dutch word spotent spotent kind of way, which means derisive kind of way, mm. not derisive so much. Well, sometimes it's close to it. I, I reckon you're right. <laughs> How do you feel in your heart about when you think about orders like that and, and religion in the Catholic Church? I, you know, I recently talked to another nun. She had my phone number for some reason and she phoned me and said, why am I phoning you? And I said, well, let's have a conversation. I said, I'm, I'm interested to, to know how you nuns now live the vows of poverty and chastity and obedience because I know how I lived them in the 60s, but how do you live them now? And, you know, it's, it's exactly the same as it was back then. The mentality hasn't changed at all. The nuns are kind, kinder now, you know, and they're more useful to people um, than, than the order that I belong to, which was a teaching order, but founded at the time when, when girls were, weren't educated, when didn't have general education at the time. But I was so amazed, married to Jesus, and I said, do you think of Jesus as children? Do you think Jesus is a person? Yeah, of course Jesus is a person. To me, Jesus is not a person anymore, you see. <laughs> He's a global consciousness, but not mm. a person. To me, personhood is not exactly the reality of things. Mm. Well, intellectually, I know this, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to really, really get it. So I was really amazed. But And the church, the Catholic Church, I've just recently got into news Letters from from the Vatican. They make a big deal out of blessing gay couples, provided there's a provision, two provisions. They have to know that this, you know, that they are still in the wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and they sincerely must admit it, or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's it's incredible. So you know, I I don't have much good to say about the Catholic Church except that, not for the hierarchy in particular. Yeah. Because they know better. Mm. They know they must know better. Yeah, and the books I've got in their secret library, I hope they come to light. You know, mm. before long that the world gets to read those things. But the people, the Catholic, the Catholic Catholics in themselves, are so sincere, a lot of them, and they're so kind. You know, they have taken kindness to heart, mm. like charitable kindness. And, you know, that's a good thing. I mean, you know, that's the best thing that can happen out of Catholic religion, really. Yeah. Mm. When you look at the state of religion, you know, I mean, I think one of the big catalysts in the book was Vatican II. And actually that was seemed to be the catalyst that sort of shot you out of it <laughs> because mm. they, they said some some meaningful changes that would make life better for you guys and you were the only one that sort of took it up and everyone looked at you like you're an alien. And that seemed to be the the catalyst that propelled you out of it. And unless there's like a, a solid Vatican III, it doesn't look like anyone's going to join up to those kind of things anymore. Yeah. The order I belong to, though, they, they read my book 
okay? And they said, I, I went to visit them a couple of times afterwards. And uh, Sister Kevin, was a long, long t- I mentioned Sister Kevin in the book, okay? She was there from the very beginning, since 1950, when we first came to live in Q in, in Melbourne on the convent grounds. Sister Kevin said, we, we read the book and we didn't like it, Carla, but we had to admit that it was all true. Really? That's what she said. Hmm. And it it has impacted the nuns enormously. They've got completely changed. Mm. They've completely changed. They always had good manners, but now they've got uh, kindness as well. Yeah. Yeah. My, I really felt for you during those years because I could see, you know, with the benefit of being an old, relatively old person myself, I feel. But just what a young person would, how you could get into it and how you could get wrapped up into it and, and how you could stick with it despite all the mistreatment. You know, you can you can really see when, you know, they say, I don't know who discovered water, but it wasn't a fish. So when you're in it, it's really tough, isn't it? Like, what did it feel like for you? Mm-hmm. Well, I was, you know, I was hooked on, on the Catholic religion, which is teaches sin and guilt and fear and punishment. And also the value of suffering. That's what the whole crucifixion is about in the Catholic religion. You know, I read the crucifixion as a, and big suffering of Jesus, which is not the case. But, you know, it's a misreading, but just easily read like that. Of course, I said to Jesus, you know, I have conversations with Jesus. And uh, because I'm writing another book called Saving Jesus from Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, look, it's, you have to understand that this is, this is an obvious conclusion that people come to, you know, that, that you suffer a lot for the sins of the world, <laughs> especially the, because of the predictions of Isaiah and all that. So, but it's the Course of Miracles makes it very plain what, what that was all about, really. But I believed in suffering, okay? So we, so we were prepared to do all sorts of, to, to obey all sorts of stupid commands, do all sorts of very hurtful things to ourselves, and ready to inflict it on other people as well. Mm. Because of religion, because of our belief, you know? Belief in suffering is, a, is an awful thing. And you do say at the end of the book, you explain why you felt like you needed to do that. The, this why suffering was a measure for you and you felt like that at the time because you didn't really understand how you worked, I guess was kind of the takeaway. Hmm. Well, you know, if you believe that in, in suffering, that that makes you a good person. Yeah. You, your self-image, your self-image to yourself as a good person depends on how much suffering you can bear. Yeah. You already lost, you know. You've you've already done yourself a bad deal doing that. <laughs> There's a bit right on the, at the end that I laughed at. So to, to outline how the book kind of works, it's your it's your time post war. It's three three acts, and so time post war, time in the convents through a few different countries, and then time as a prostitute, mainly in Perth, and then actually the third act feels like probably six acts to me. Another like three in there, isn't there? Because it's kind of that redemption, exploration, and then a sort of an understanding at the end. And there's a really funny anecdote, and it was about you realised the nun where you were whipping yourself with for redemption. You realised that she was kind of not really doing it properly. <laughs> and you're like, "What? I've been doing this like really hard the whole time." <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I found that was super funny. But when you realised that suffering wasn't the answer, how did you come about that realisation? Oh, uh, well, it's it's, uh, it's actually. Plain as a nose on your face. When you come to think of it, it's only a belief that could possibly make that true for you. But of course, in miracles explains that you know guilt is a very common is is our baseline human feeling. So religion just builds on it. We all feel guilty. If we didn't feel guilty, we wouldn't have any sickness. We wouldn't have any problems in our life, really. So recognizing how much guilt we actually carry with us. And how important it is just to forgive ourselves all the time. That's what self-love really amounts to. It's for, f- being able to forgive yourself, not how to, how, make you, how to make yourself look pretty. It's how to learn to forgive yourself. Mm. So it was during, during my time as a prostitute, actually, that I came to face again all those feelings that I had suppressed as a child. Because as a child, I experienced guilt to the bottom of the barrel, to the very bottom. Like I completely lost in my beliefs, in my 